As we look into the Word this morning, the prevailing question for us is going to be, what is ministry? What is ministry? What makes ministry legitimate? Where does ministry happen? Who has the right to do ministry? Do you have to have a certain degree, a certain credential? Do you have to wear a certain position? Do you have to have a certain title or a certain name associated with you? Do you have to be a certain age? Do you have to have gone to a certain school or graduated with a certain degree? All of us, for whatever reason or the other, face seasons or uh, questions or feelings of inadequacy, don't we? We wonder if we're really qualified to do the kind of ministry that God has called us to. And this morning, as we come to the Word of God, as we, as we come to evaluate the life and ministry of Jesus, what's going to come front and center for us is we see Jesus serving in five different ministry settings, five different uh, places um, uh, uh, of ministry that he, that he goes to. We're going to recognize that ministry doesn't just hap- have to happen in the church. Ministry is meant to happen wherever you are. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are called to ministry. Ministry in your home, ministry in your school, ministry in your workplace, ministry in your neighborhood, ministry at the gas station. Wherever you are, God has called you to be a minister of his. I'm really grateful for the ministry that I see happening all around me in this church. Uh, the hearts that God has given to each of you to, to press in and have open eyes and willing hearts to do ministry wherever you are. Uh, yesterday, I, um, I, I was able to, to see some of this up close and personal as several of you came to help pick up boxes and, uh, and move furniture and come alongside a brother and sister in Christ who are part of our, of our fellowship and, and doing some manual labor for the sake of ministry, of service, of, of encouragement and helping and supporting. That is ministry, and, and God has called us to that kind of ministry. And, and, and by the way, it was not just ministry to this family, but it was ministry to, to those who were unbelievers who were also part of helping, and they got to see the body of Christ rally around and help. It was a portrait of the gospel. It was a picture of Jesus' care for physical things that we're going to begin to see even more as we step into this study, and I'll just talk about that in a moment. There was also ministry that happened last weekend. For those of you who came, I think there were 11 of you that came to help help set up an Awana Grand Prix track on a Saturday afternoon. And what's uh, really cool about that is what normally took, or took uh, Thursday night and, sa- and Friday and Saturday and Sunday to do, um, Bob was gracious and willing to flex a bit, a bit and let's see how this works. Can we try it to, to pack it all in on a Saturday afternoon? And several of you showed up and God was gracious to, to work through your willingness to set that track up and not only minister to the Iwana kids on Monday night, but also minister to our community who was able to come and use our building on Saturday morning for soccer. It doesn't seem like a significant step of ministry, but, but it, those are the kinds of ways that God has called us to, to represent him in serving and loving one another in big and little ways. Several of you went to the Men of God conference yesterday. There was ministry that happened in the cars as, as you're carpooling with one another, talking about the Bible, getting to know one another and, and ministering to each other, stirring one another up to love and good deeds on the ride there and the ride back. There's midweek prayer that's happening at the McEverkins house. And I think as I come to understand that more and more of you are coming to, to spend time and commit yourselves to praying for the ministry here, for the work of God in your communities, and, and, and getting uh, a sense of, uh, of the presence of God among you as you invite him to do a powerful work in your lives, in the lives of the people around you. This past Thursday, there was a group of, of men that came and prayed to the church. And every Sunday morning, there's a group that prays in the conference room, praying for each of you in this room 
as you worship God, as you listen to the scriptures, and as you carry out God's ministry through you in the week, wherever you are. There's ministry that's happening both within the walls of this building, but especially ministry outside of the walls of this church. We have been called to ministry wherever we are. And that's the lesson for us this morning. A lesson to awaken in our hearts a tenderness to the ministry that God has put in front of each of us on a daily basis. Do we see it? Do we sense it? Has God given us a burden for it? Are we willing to step into it when we're exhausted, when we have things to do, when there are other responsibilities? Are we willing to step in and echo the heart of Jesus for the ministry that he's called us to? Well, beginning next week, we're gonna, we're gonna look at the mission statement of God uh, spelled out for us in Luke chapter four, verses 18 and 19. We're gonna look at it phrase by phrase, and I would invite you to pick up one of these study guides in the back. This will help you walk through this process of, uh, of preparing your hearts for the word of God, and I would encourage you at nine o'clock, there's a, a group who are gonna be studying and, and, and looking through this, discussing the word of God, getting ready to hear the word of God at 11. I would encourage you to be part of that. It will be a blessing to you. Maximize your, your exposure to the word of God. Let the word have its way in your heart. But this morning, as we step into another uh, context of ministry here in Luke chapter four, you remember that Jesus has just ministered in Nazareth and, and initially things seem to be going really well. I mean, after all, it's the, the people's initial response is they marveled at his gracious words. They, they were astonished at the, at the wonderful words of God. You might think, wow, what better reaction could you ever hope for? And then five verses later, as Jesus will tell them pointed truth about the real purpose for his coming, the real purpose of Messiah, not just establishing a people for himself, a national Israel, as it were, but especially in calling Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles, to faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't want to have anything to do with that. And so they sought to throw Jesus off the cliff. They, they wanted to extinguish this prophet. They wanted to silence his message. They wanted nothing to do with the true gospel. Their hearts we're clear. This morning as we look at the ministry of Jesus, I, I want you to remember that, that Jesus in his ministry offered this standing invitation, this open invitation for anyone to follow him. It wasn't just a ministry that Jesus was carrying out personally. It was a ministry that Jesus intends for everyone in this room who calls themselves a follower of Jesus a believer in Jesus Christ for salvation, he calls us to the same kind of ministry. You remember that Jesus said to his disciples, follow me. But I, I wanna just draw your attention to Luke chapter nine just for a moment. Luke chapter nine, verses 23 to 25, where Jesus says to all who were standing there listening to him, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. There it is. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits himself? You see, the cost of discipleship is significant. That Jesus will lay his life down for believers. He will invite us to come and receive him by faith to ask forgiveness for our sins, to in repentance turn away from sin and turn to God and see that Jesus is the only way of salvation. And for those who do that, Jesus in giving his life for us in exchange has purchased our lives for him. If you're a believer this morning, your life is not your own. It doesn't belong to you. It's not up to you to call the shots. That God has bought you with a price, which means that you now exist for the purpose of pleasing him. I love how Paul puts this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20. 
He says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So do what? Glorify God. Glorify God in your body. You don't belong to yourself. Your priorities, your purposes, your destinations, your your assets, your resources, your family, your job, whatever you have belongs to him and is meant to be spent for the glory of God. And so the ministry that we're going to see in Jesus that transcends every scenario, every setting, is a ministry to which we're also called. But in order for us to understand the the ministry that we've been called to, we need to understand the one who set the example. So look with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 4. I just want to point out these, these five different settings, these five scenarios we find Jesus doing ministry in so we can begin to 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 understand and be reminded again of the kind of ministry God has called us to. Notice in Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 31, again, it's on page 860 if you are in the Pew Bible. Look at it with me. It says, He went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. Now drop down to verse 36 for a moment. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. The first context of ministry is where, church? What do you see? It's in the synagogue, right? The first context of ministry is in the synagogue. The crowd is gathered there, and they are surprised by the authority they see in the person of Jesus Christ. There are a couple of things that strike my attention. I just want to call out and make some observations this morning as we're moving through so you can see in your own life how to access the same kind of power and authority. Where does it come from? How, 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 do, we, how do we get to enjoy and experience the same kind of ministry potential as Jesus? First, I want you to notice the authority of the Word of God. The authority of the word. And by the way, the authority is in the word through the spirit of God. This is the word exousia. It means authority to rule or jurisdiction or control or power. Jesus has a word of authority. This is the same word, by the way, that Satan uses in his temptation at the beginning of chapter 4. The same word that he uses in chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Look at there with me for a moment. The devil takes Jesus up and shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He says to him, To you I will give all this authority, same word, and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I will. But as you know, the condition was that Jesus had to bow down and worship Satan. So what does Jesus do? Jesus says, no, Satan. I I don't need authority from you. I will get authority from the Father in the Father's way and in the Father's time, and that's what we see here later in chapter four, the power and authority of God the Father through his word, through Jesus, is being ministered to the people who are there in the synagogue. Jesus waited for the right time, the right way, the right place for God to give him the right authority when it was necessary. He trusted in the sovereignty of God. He trusted in the waiting power of God. I will wait for his timing. I will trust in his plan and I will not worship you, Satan. And so the power comes. Authority will come through the word of God. And and by the way, this is what we're going to see as the common thread that laces its way through each of these settings. The power of God in each of these ministry settings is coming through the spirit of God and through the word of God. By the way, it is the same spirit that everybody in this room, if you are a believer, a follower of God, everyone in this room, you have the indwelling power of the spirit of God. 
And you have, by God's grace, the word of God in your hands to access, to use, to employ in the ministry settings in which you find yourself. Authority comes. Now notice in verses 32 to 35, this is where my second observation comes from. It says, And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. He cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out, having done him no harm. Second observation I want to draw your attention to is the setting in which this takes place. I want you to notice the location of this spiritual healing. The location, of course, was the synagogue, which is our equivalent of the church. But just because this man was coming to church, just because this man was hearing and receiving the word of God, just because for week after week after week he was sitting next to other people who had a love for God, he was still a man who was in desperate need of spiritual healing. I want you to understand this morning that just because you come to church, however long it's been, and whether or not you have prayed a prayer, or been baptized, or become a member, or involved yourself in ministry, it does not guarantee that there's actually a work of God that's happened in your life. It does not guarantee that you, like this man, don't also need a spiritual work of healing. It can only come as the word will transform you will activate within your heart a a love for the truth and a desire, not for self-glory as we saw last week, the the gospel that was was oriented towards their own self-satisfaction, but a a glorying in the gospel that is focused on Jesus. Here's this man in desperate need of spiritual healing, and wouldn't you know it happens of all places in the synagogue. But what we have to offer, I want you to understand, what we have to offer here is is not a a flashy program, lasers or fog machines, trendy coffee bars or uh, special uh, things that would draw attention. (laughs) But what we have to offer this morning is the authoritative power of the word of God. And that's all we need. Those things aren't bad in and of themselves. But our hope isn't dependent upon attracting the world to us through worldly things. The hope that we have is attracting people by what makes us distinct, that which sets us apart from the world. The other worldliness that we enjoy because of the power of the Spirit and the Word of God is the very thing that distinguishes us from the world and thus makes us relevant to the world because they can't get it anywhere else. We have the word, and because of the word and our commitment to the truth, and because of the authority of that word of God, we actually have something to offer to a world that's broken they can't find anywhere else. Anchor your heart and your life and your confidence in the word of God. It alone will change hearts. Change the hearts of desperate people who need to know the transforming power of the word. It is the power of God through his word that accomplishes this kind of miracle. And while we may not be accomplishing the miracles of casting out demons, God has allowed us by his grace and through the power of his word to accomplish better works The better work of turning dead hearts to life through a commitment to the word of God who can do that regenerative work in the life of those who do not know him. Are you speaking the word of God? Are you delighting in the word of God? Are you anchoring your heart in the word of God? It has to begin with you before it can ever flow out to others. Jesus had a ministry in the synagogue. (laughs) a ministry, as it were, in the church. But Jesus moves out to to another setting, another context for ministry. We see that in verses 38 and 39. Notice it says, 
And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and began to serve them. Jesus has just spent himself in teaching. And any of you who have had any kind of teaching ministry will understand the the weight and the gravity of teaching that, that spends a person emotionally and spiritually and physically. There is a, a burden that preachers and teachers carry in delivering a word that is faithful and clear. It is a, a burden that is often uh, compared with delivery, and certainly it has probably very bad correlation with delivery, but it, it feels like a delivery sometimes on Sunday morning as, as the process of trying to, to provide the, the word of God in a way that is meaningful and clear. It, there is a work to be done. I am blessed by those who pray throughout the week for the ministry that happens on Sunday morning. I, I'm blessed for those of you, even this morning, who came up and said, Pastor, I want you to know that I'm, I'm praying for you. I, I think about Romans chapter 15, verse 30, where, where the apostle Paul uses the word soon agonizomai, which is to, to suffer with, strive together with me, he says. Strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. And that's the, the ministry that, that God has allowed you to participate in as, as the ministry of the word has its way in the hearts of the people who come. I'm blessed by that. And I'm blessed by many of you who pray on Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, the ministry of the word. I'm blessed by my family who prays. And I'm blessed by my, by my children who as we drive over on a Sunday morning, they can testify to the... <laughs> To the, to the weight that daddy feels every Sunday morning. And in some way, I feel like they, like Aaron and her, lift up their hands to God and, and bless and pray for the ministry on the mountain so that God might do a mighty work here. Ministry that can happen whether you're old or young, whether you have degrees or no degrees. Are your eyes open to the ministry? Are you willing to step in to that ministry, that work that God has called you to have? In Mark chapter 1, verses 29 to 30, which is a correlating passage to our story here in Luke, he says, And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. If I have not mentioned it already, now we've transitioned from a synagogue to a home. There's the new context for ministry. This is the first observation I want to make this morning. That... So often when we think about ministry, we think about it in the context of church. This is where we do ministry, right? But I want you to realize that this is just one out of the five different places where Jesus will do his work. This context in the home, this this context of ministry that happens here, by the way, is perhaps the most potent and most valuable resource that we have as families, as individuals. Are we maximizing the home for ministry? Jesus is at a place probably where he needs some refreshment after having spent himself in ministry in the synagogue. He comes home, he comes to the home of of Peter and Andrew certainly for the sake of refreshment. And by the way, refreshment is is important and and often very essential. But But in Jesus in coming to the home of Peter and Andrew, is willing to press in. He's willing to do the ministry that God the Father has put in front of him. He's willing to to serve in ways that he didn't expect. And Peter and Andrew and James and John, who were also there, helped to identify an issue, and Jesus is willing to rebuke this fever and to heal Peter's mother-in-law. Second observation, I want you to notice the willing heart of Jesus. The willing heart of Jesus. This will only happen as Jesus has eyes to see and a willingness to extend himself yet again. While coming from the synagogue and being spent in ministry, if you're anything like me, this is not the time for ministry to happen. I I, want to kick back. I want to take a nap. I I need to unwind a little bit. 
But Jesus is committed to trusting in the power of God and the sovereignty of God of bringing ministry to him in the right time. And so Jesus will anchor himself and tether himself to the strength of God and press in to ministry again. Jesus is willing to serve. And notice in serving, he rebukes this fever. This is the same word that is used of him rebuking the demon. By the way, this is the language, this language of rebuking this spirit or this fever is not used in Mark's account. It's not used in Matthew's account, but it's used here. Luke wants to call our attention again to the ministry of the word. The same ministry of the word that we saw in the synagogue is the same ministry of the word that we'll see in the home. It is the ministry of the word that brings power to the situation. And Luke wants to call attention to this word coming again, this word of the Lord coming at this time to bring physical healing, which will point to spiritual healing. Of course, fulfilling, as we'll look beginning next week for five weeks, fulfilling the mission of Messiah from Luke chapter four, verses 18 and 19, proclaiming good news to the poor, proclaiming liberty to the captives, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, a proclamation ministry. Luke wants us to see this for ourselves. Do you realize that the home is perhaps the greatest place for ministry? Not only do you get to serve your family, but you get to serve alongside your family. And those who who are single, I want you to realize that you're not exempt from this, that, that there are great ways for you to serve in your home as well. As you invite people over, as you make yourself available to be real with people, to to enjoy relationship with them, to interact over the things that are important. The home is a place of helping your family, helping your friends see how diverse ministry can be, how informal, how natural, how regular, how fun. I'm really grateful for my mother and father who made the home kind of the conduit, the, the center of ministry as they invited people into our house on a consistent basis. Missionaries, guests from our church, leaders, neighbors, foster kids, unwed mothers, single groups, teachers from my school, people from the community that were pushed away and isolated and cast out. They were welcome in our home. There was no pressure to impress. The house didn't have to be immaculate. The meal didn't have to be a feast. The gathering didn't have to be formal. formal. But it positioned my family, my sisters and I, to see that ministry needs to happen wherever we are. They valued the person. And they could be themselves. Do you have a heart that's open for the ministry right in your own home? Well, Jesus will move from the synagogue into Peter's home, and and now we begin to see a line forming outside of of Peter's house in verses 40 to 41. We see Jesus' ministry in his community now. It says in verse 41, or verse, uh, yes, verse 40. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And laid his, he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. Sabbath is now complete. It starts at 6 o'clock on Friday and moves to 6 o'clock on Saturday. And now the, the news has spread. The, the news that we see In verse 14, Jesus returning in the power of the Spirit and news about him went throughout the entire country. That kind of news that spread, it didn't just happen over time, but it certainly happened in the immediate vicinity of the moments of Jesus' ministry. You can see this enthusiastic crowd. They were on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and all the other fancy social media places. Actually, 
Because of the ministry of Jesus in actually fixing problems, remember, there were no hospitals, there were no medical clinics, and Jesus was actually fixing problems that could not be fixed any other way, and you can believe that these people, after going to the synagogue and seeing what Jesus did, they were going out to all the friends and family members they knew who needed help, and there they are beginning to line up at the door. We see in Mark chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Two observations of this passage. Notice that Jesus continues to serve in the power of the Spirit. After this marathon day of ministry, in a synagogue, in a home, now Jesus has to look forward to an entire evening of meeting needs. And make no mistake that meeting needs was costly for Jesus. It, it, it drained him of energy. And, and while he was accessing the strength of the Holy Spirit, there was still energy that was being spent ministering to people. But he continues to press in. He doesn't call it quits. He entrusts himself to the Father. He depends upon the, the Spirit's power. Second, notice that Jesus serves indiscriminately. And what I mean is he serves without partiality. He doesn't pick and choose. He doesn't sort out the small and the big issues. He doesn't prioritize the rich or the poor. He stands ready to serve a people without partiality until the line is complete. As we see in verse 40, he laid his hands on every one of them. And Jesus does this in order to demonstrate the heart of God for people. A desire to not just fix physical problems, but especially to call attention to the ministry of Messiah and calling attention to the greater work of helping their souls, not just their bodies. We see in verse 42 that Jesus ministers in private. Notice, and when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. Now, what did he do there? Well, We find in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, which is the correlating story in the Gospel of Mark, exactly what happened out there. It says, in rising very early, which probably was somewhere between 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, by the way, after this marathon day of ministry, it says, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. This was ministry. As Jesus commits himself to the Father, relies on the power of the Spirit, asks for the wisdom of God to provide wisdom and direction for his ministry, and he presses in. I want you to realize that Jesus sets the example of showing that spiritual battles are won through spiritual power. And that power only comes from God, regardless of where you are. Your home, your school, your workplace, Wherever you are, spiritual power comes from God. Jesus takes this struggle to the Father. He knows that if he's going to revitalize, if he's going to recharge and refocus, he needs to have an abiding relationship with the Father. The same kind of relationship, by the way, that Jesus calls us to enjoy and experience in John 15, verses 7 and 8, where he says, If you abide in me, In my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, and you will bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Jesus is in this desolate place, free of distraction, a place of privacy, a place that he had to go to. It took intentionality, it took sacrifice of time, it was costly, and he was alone with God. This word, desolate place, by the way, is the same word that we find at the beginning of chapter four where the Spirit leads Jesus out into the wilderness or out into a desolate place. And I love this because the place of testing now becomes the place of triumph. It is the place where Jesus now goes to retreat to find his satisfaction and help from God himself. Your ministry will only amount to fruitfulness as you couple yourself with God in abiding relationship through prayer. 
Finally, we see in verses 42 to 44, as I close, we see, that we see his ministry to the world. His ministry to the world. Look at this. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him, and he would have, and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. The whole purpose of Jesus' ministry and coming was to proclaim good news. This is the, the same word from which we get the gospel. Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And instead of keeping that gospel message in Nazareth and keeping that gospel message in Capernaum, Jesus had a heart to make sure that all of Israel could hear. His heart was concerned for the people of Israel that they would know the true gospel and respond to that gospel. And this morning, I wonder, do you know the gospel this morning? Do you recognize that the gospel begins with a recognition of your sin? That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? And, and, and really all that means is that we realize our imperfection. Everybody in this room can, can testify, yeah, I'm not perfect. And because of our imperfection, as we look at the glory of God or the holiness of God, we recognize that there must be judgment because a holy God cannot associate with sinful, wicked people. And so it, what God has done is he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who was perfect in every way. He lived the perfect life that none of us could live. Matter of fact, it says that he fulfilled the law to every little detail, the, the smallest, most minute little detail. Jesus kept. He fulfilled the law in every way. And then Jesus was punished. And that's what sin demands. It demands punishment. In Romans chapter 6, 23, it says the wages or the penalty of sin is death. That's what you and I deserve. And that's what Jesus had to do. He had to offer himself as a substitute for you and I. He had to die on the cross so that his righteous life, while he was righteous, was still condemned because his righteousness would be placed on those who believe and he would take the sin of those who will believe onto himself and pay for that sin so that God the Father could look at us as if we were Jesus. The great exchange that happened on the cross we inherit the righteousness of God and we give to him our wickedness. He died for that for us. The condemnation was met and paid for on the cross so we can experience the favor of God, the Lord's favor on us if we believe. But there's only one way to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And, and it's as simple as believing Paul will say to the, to the jailer in Philippi, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This morning, do you believe? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? A, a relationship that is settled for eternity because of the work, the finished work of Christ on the cross. And to those of the rest of us who have believed, is the message of the gospel so built into your life. You can't help but share it with the people around you because you want to, to welcome them in to participate not only in worship of God but also in, in the delight and satisfaction that only comes with knowing and believing in Jesus. May God help us day by day to realize that the ministry he's called us to is a ministry wherever you are. May God help us to fulfill that ministry, to have open eyes and open hearts, willingness to press in and trust that God will provide the strength that we need to do the ministry that seems so impossible in the moment. May God help us. Let me pray. God, we thank you for the example of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray in this moment, right now, that your Holy Spirit will have his way in our hearts to awaken dead hearts to spiritual life, and for the rest of us to help to awaken 
a new burden, a new passion for loving and pleasing you from day to day, carrying out the mission that you've called us to. God, may we be faithful. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. If there's anyone this morning who doesn't know Jesus and wants to know, I would love to share who Jesus is and introduce you to how you can have a personal relationship with him. I know, that, I know there's others who would, who would love to do the same. So don't leave if God is pricking your heart and telling you to, to do business with God. For the rest of us, carry out the mission he's called you to. Be faithful. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Thank you.